everyone and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Corey Shockey. I'm the Director of Foreign and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute and I'll be moderating today's program. We'd like to thank our members, donors, and supporters for making this and all our other programs possible. We're grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the Commonwealth Club during these uncertain times. Today, I'm excited to be joined by my friends, Peter Baker and Susan, Glass, Susan Glasser, co-authors of the new book, The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III. When discussing the transformation of the Republican Party from the 1970s to modern conservatism, James A. Baker III is an important part of the story. Baker was the right-hand man of Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, serving as White House Chief of Staff for President Reagan and both Chief of Staff and Secretary of State for President Bush. But Baker's life and rise in politics isn't well documented, leading this terrific husband and wife team of Peter Baker and Susan Glasser to write his story. Peter is the current White House correspondent for the New York Times, where he's covered the presidencies of Donald Trump, Barack Obama, George W. Bush, and Bill Clinton. Susan Glasser is a longtime former journalist at the Washington Post and the author of the important column, Letter from Trump's Washington in the New Yorker. This couple's written together before. You can read more about Vladimir Putin in their 2005 book, Kremlin Rising. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour, and I want to ask for your questions, too. So if you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube or the comments on Facebook, and we'll be getting to them later in the program. Thank you, Peter and Susan, for joining us. Thank you, Corey, for hosting us. No, it's great. I we miss you. We, wish you <laughs> person. we miss you. <laughs> Thank you, my friends. I want to start our conversation by reading a short passage from the book and, and then ask you to expand on it. You write, in a city full of ambition, where everyone saw himself as the next Kissinger, or at least the next Bush, the corporate lawyer from Texas had somehow managed the impossible, going from obscure to insider in the blink of an eye. 
start us out by, by telling us how does he pull that magic trick? <laughs> Well, you know, it, you're right to, to start it there because I think one of the things we discovered in doing this book, Corey, and thank you so much for doing this into the Commonwealth Club. One of the things we discovered in working on this is that Jim Baker really was this accidental superstar uh, uh, of Washington. You know, we're familiar with his incredible resume, uh, but not so much of the how he got there and how uh, unlikely it was. He, in some ways, was the world's most successful mid-career switch, right? He was, you know, 40 years old by the time he came to Washington. Uh, you know, really, that was a product of, uh, you know, the fact that he had this best friend from the tennis courts of the Houston Country Club who happened to be named George Herbert Walker Bush. And uh, actually, the family tragedy that the death of his first wife of cancer at a very young age. Uh, and those two things led him on a very different path than the sort of uh, corporate lawyer in a very constrained, very elite world of uh, Houston corporate lawyers. Uh, and he ended up in Washington, where the opportunity was laid bare before him in part, again, because of this incredible accident of timing, Watergate was like a neutron bomb that sort of eliminated the uh, existing ruling class of the Republican Party. And uh, it led to enormous opportunities for someone like a Jim Baker who landed in this obscure appointment at the Commerce Department, which is not the center of the action then or now or ever, actually. <laughs> in Washington. <laughs> and he gets there uh, and within one year, he's running President Jerry Ford's campaign for president. Uh, this has never happened before, obviously, uh, and it speaks to uh, this story of this man that we discovered is really sort of a series of progressively bigger and bigger playing fields on which he thrived, and yet uh, he might never have known that. He might have simply lived out his whole life as his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather had before him, uh, living a life of, of privilege and discipline in Houston. So the point about discipline reminds me that uh, I didn't realize until I read the book that he is a Marine veteran. Yeah. Did you talk, in what way did his military service, if any at all, um, affect how he viewed Washington and the policymaking process? Yeah, no, I think it was actually a critical moment in his life growing up. He didn't serve in combat. And he only served a two-year hitch. He was, you know, he came of age in the Korean War, and he was at Princeton University, and all of his friends were trying to figure out, oh my gosh, you know, how do we get out of service if we can? I mean, there wasn't a question of dodging uh, service, but you know, if you're going to go in, what did you want to do? What could you do that would make your assignment better? He went into um, uh, the Marines and, and ended up serving, as he said, that he served the Korean War. Uh, in the Mediterranean on a ship uh, there where obviously they so, saw no combat. But it was, I think, a moment of of, of growing up. You know, at Princeton, he was kind of a ne'er-do-well to some extent. I mean, he was a member of uh, the right-hand club that wasn't, the right-wing club. It wasn't actually a commentary on his politics. It was a commentary on what you did to get your beer to your, to your mouth. He was a, you know, a tennis player and a rugby player. And he was, you know, he dated this uh, young, beautiful woman he met in, in, on the beach. And he wasn't a great student. And I think that it was really the Marines that kind of turned things around for him and taught him discipline in the, in the way that his father would have wanted him to, to be disciplined. And, uh, you know, and it was a critical moment. He, he identified with other Marines for the rest of his life. When he was Secretary of State, the Commandant of the Marine Corps came in to visit him one day and gave him some business cards. And the business card said, James A. Baker III, uh, Marine, and also Secretary of State. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. It also seems to me this may be one point of connection between him and George Shultz. I was thinking as I read the book that uh, I can't think of any two people who had had such a wide diversity of high level government appointments as the two of them. Uh, so uh, for, for folks who haven't yet read the book, talk through all of the high level uh, departmental jobs that Secretary Baker had? Well, there are an awful lot of them. And what, what's so unusual about him really is that once he came to Washington, he combined a portfolio of politics and policy making at the highest level in a way that is really unusual and almost unduplicable uh, in, in the world we live in today. So, you know, he was, uh, I think, first and foremost, a really brilliant 
uh, political campaign manager, and he ran five different national presidential campaigns, uh, which again, is sort of unheard of. Uh, we tend to celebrate somebody who wins one or two of those. I mean, they become household names, you know, James Carville and David Axelrod and, you know, Karl Rove, but uh, he did that. And he also was the gold standard for White House chief of staff, uh, widely considered uh, Democrats as much as Republicans are extremely interested in understanding the secrets of uh, how Baker did it in Reagan's White House. Uh, then he also was treasury secretary for Reagan in which they just so happened to rewrite the tax code in 1986 in a deal that has never been replicated since. Uh, and then he went back ran Bush's 1988, a very scorched earth campaign, really, in many ways, uh, and then switched hats again, uh, went back into statesman mode, and was the Secretary of State, not just uh, you know at any ordinary moment, but at this unbelievable hinge point in history uh, from 1989 to 1991, when it was essentially the end of the Cold War and the unraveling of the Soviet Union and its sort of uh, Eastern European uh, satellite empire. And so th there couldn't have been a more consequential career. I haven't even mentioned, you know, the Gulf War, which also took place uh, in this period of time, uh, or basically any major crisis that you've heard of, uh, you know, from the end of Watergate to the end of the Cold War. Uh, Baker was there in the middle of it. And then this fascinating postscript in 2000, when he was essentially the key player uh, in the Florida recount for his friend's son, George W. Bush, uh, that as we all know, uh, uh, led to Bush getting the presidency. So, you know, it's just a, a breathtaking kind of uh, background. Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the contradictions, it seems for me, in his character, is that he was so brilliant as a campaign manager, and yet he himself was an unsuccessful um, political candidate. And it made me think that very often, baseball's best hitters are not good batting coaches. Yeah. <laughs> and I wonder if you guys have a theory about why he wasn't a more successful political candidate himself, given how effective he was as a campaign manager. Yeah, that's a great question. You're right. He runs for office just one time in 1978 for Attorney General of Texas. And look, you know, it wasn't a good uh, time to be a Republican in Texas at the time. It was still a Democratic state that was trending toward Republicans, but hadn't gotten there yet. So he had some disadvantages to begin with. But you're right. He wasn't a good retail camp campaigner. I, we talked with one of the reporters from Houston who covered his campaign. He says, you know, he would fly around uh, on the plane with him from state to state, uh, from city to city in the state. And he would he taught Baker how to play gin rummy because there would be these long silences where Baker wouldn't have anything to say. Or they would walk <laughs> through one of these Texas, you know, county fairs and Baker would just like zip right past all these people without stopping to shake their hands and say, hey, I'm Jim Baker, but he'd head straight to the tent where the county judge was. And he'd, you know, he knew how to work the county judge, right? So Baker was a backroom guy. He knew how to work the levers of, of, of government and power, but he wasn't a baby kisser. He wasn't a backslapper in the, in the public sort of way. That was his friend, George Bush. And I think he learned from 1978 that his place was at the side of a, a candidate like George Bush who would be out there in front. It didn't mean that he ever completely gave up. He thought about running in 1996 uh, and ultimately decided for president, but ultimately decided not to. I think he decided that his, his strength was being ultimately a cabinet secretary or otherwise a campaign person. Speaking of his strengths, the part of the book where you both describe uh, how he handles Attorney General Ed Meese in the Reagan administration, I thought was such a virtuoso um, illustration of what Baker was brilliant at. Won't you share some of that with the Commonwealth Club's listeners? <laughs> well, you know, you're right. This is sort of the quintessential Baker power move uh, and, you know, studied by aspiring power brokers for <laughs> uh, generations to come, in fact. Uh, what happened was really kind of extraordinary, right? Baker had been George W. Bush, H. W. Bush's guy in the 1980 campaign. And for Reagan, having won, to invite him in to the inner circle uh, where he was viewed very suspiciously. Uh, spoke volumes about the perceived competence uh, that they were so eager 
to hire. So Baker comes in as White House chief of staff and Ed Meese, he's been the keeper of the ideological flame uh, for Reagan in California. The Reagan revolution is in part, uh, you know, his, but he was also famously disorganized. Uh, you know, they refer to his briefcase as the place where papers go to die. Uh, and I think other people around Reagan thought this will be a disaster uh, if we have this guy as chief of staff. So they engineered uh, this move whereby Baker, who had so impressed him, uh, them, uh, would uh, become the, the main guy. But that didn't go over well. And Reagan was very conflict averse. And he basically said, well, you work it out with, with Ed. And so there was this, it was called the Troika. It was Meese and Baker and Mike Deaver, uh, sort of the image maker body man uh, as the third member. And Baker had to awkwardly sit down with Meese right after the November 1980 election and actually divvy up responsibilities. And, uh, you know, Meese, thought he was getting the better of it. And he asked for uh, things like a prestigious title. Uh, and he wanted to be uh, equivalent to a cabinet member. And he wanted to have a nice name. Uh, he wanted to have a grand office that Henry Kissinger had sat in. Uh, and Jim Baker, you know, he just played him. He said, yeah, absolutely. Let's just write that down. That's fine. I'll just take care of some of the, you know, administrative matters like, you know, personnel and communications and legislative affairs. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll sit in the White House chief of staff's office. And, you know, of course, those were all the things that make a difference in the White House and especially controlling all the paper flow to and from the president. That That is absolutely the way to rule anything in Washington. And then to make it even worse at the very end, after they had already agreed to this, me says, oh, one more thing. I would just like to put down that I can have access uh, to any meeting with the president. Uh, Ann Baker says, okay, well, that's fine with me. Just for symmetry's sake, let me put that down on my column too. And so without even realizing it, Mies had traded away his final privilege, which was the right to meet alone with Ronald Reagan. And, and of course it was a masterful job. We talked to somebody who said from that day forward, every day of the Reagan administration, Jim Baker acquired power and others lost it. I also thought it was such a nice grace note that you recount in the book, the way that during, um, during high level meetings in the White House, uh, Baker bonded with Meese by both of them writing nasty notes back and forth every time Al Haig was talking. <laughs> yeah, they had a shared, uh, shared mutual animosity there. That's true. I saw that that you point out in the book that Baker actually kept one of the notes and yeah. you found it in his files. And I thought that was, you know, for a relationship with Meese where over time Baker's the one accruing power and he's managed to marginalize Meese to, you know, have the joy of, of making sport of Al Haig together when <laughs> Haig clearly knew it too. That comes out in your book. Yeah, was, exactly. was just, I thought, wow, that's real artistry. Well, and the artistry too, by the way, goes to this. So Baker respected Mies, even if they were rivals. And they were rivals. There were some pretty tough moments. Baker at one point referred to him as the popping, what was it, the popping fresh doughboy, dough boy, right? The Pillsbury Pillsbury doughboy, dough sorry. And Mies uh, is part of a cabal that torches uh, Baker's attempt to switch to the National Security Advisor job. But you know, when it was all said and done, um, he somehow maintained a relationship with Ed Meese to the point where he, when he puts together the Iraq study group for George W. Bush in 2006, and you'll remember this, Rudy Giuliani was originally on that uh, panel and he gets booted off because he wasn't showing up for meetings basically. And, uh, and, and, and Baker replaces him with Ed Meese because A, he had, they had a relationship that could continue to be productive even though they were different types. And B, he also knew that Ed Meese would be a heat shield for conservatives in that era. So he was always thinking ahead. He, he tried not to burn bridges if he didn't have to, even with rivals. I also, one other tradecraft point that came through very clearly for me that I thought, you know, deserved a chef kiss in the margin of the text um, was the way that he not only figured out what was happening on Iran-Contra, he was not involved in any way, he's treasury secretary at the time, right? Not yeah. involved in any way, yeah. realizes what's happening, uh, goes back from a White House meeting and dictated a memo for the record about what he knew and what he didn't and what everyone had said. That was some very, very fine heat shielding. 
<laughs> well, actually, that was something that Baker was famous for, was covering his own ass. And uh, there are numerous examples of that uh, uh, that we found. Uh, you know, he kept files of uh, going back to 1976 in the convention when uh, he sort of made his political reputation by being uh, counting delegates for Jerry Ford. And Ford actually won that Ford fight against Ronald Reagan, which is the very last time there's been a contested convention. And uh, Baker had files in which he kept all the things that he considered inappropriate uh, that various uh, delegates had asked him to do. Uh, you know, people, it seems, were pretty shameless. Uh, and he really wanted to make sure he didn't get, you know, blamed for trading, uh, improperly trading favors, although he pushed it right up to the edge with some of the things I personally couldn't tell the difference <laughs> between what he thought was okay, like giving somebody a ticket to a state dinner and what wasn't okay. But um, so I had the same reaction reading the book. At several points, uh, Baker says he really doesn't like the tawdriness of politics and stuff like that, but that's what he's doing all of the time. So <laughs> that felt a little bit like, you know, what you look like to yourself isn't actually what you look like. Right. But there, it's, you're right about that. And I think that it tells us a lot about the times though as well, right? So Baker is, you know, he doesn't shy away from ruthless cutthroat politics during election years, right? He did oversee the 1988 campaign against Dukakis that involved the Willie Horton uh, case that involved, you know, talks about the Pledge of Allegiance and patriotism, things that were seen as kind of, you know, in some ways, uh, uh, you attack a man's patriotism like that was seen as kind of low. Baker is fine with that. It, you know, it's a knife fight. You got to do what you got to do to win. But then once it was over, it was over, right? And that's where we're different today. You can say 88 leads to some of our politics today, but 89 doesn't. In 89, was, as soon as these elections are over, Baker wants to sit down with the Democrats, the ones he just beat, and cut some deals, right, to get things done. In 1983, he sits down with Tip O'Neill to revamp Social Security. 1986, as Susan mentioned, tax code with the Democrats. 1989, with the Democrats to make the Contra War go away. Today's Washington, unfortunately, I think the governing is about leading into the next campaign, Whereas Baker and his generation were looking at the campaign as a way to get to government. Boy, I think that's a really powerful point. There, your, your job covering the White House shows up <laughs> in spades and your ability to have that kind of deep insight, Peter. I want to drag you two to an area of your exceptional expertise because it was my favorite part of the book. You do such a beautiful job of conjuring up what the end of the Cold War felt like when it was happening. Your descriptions of the two plus four talks and scrambling to figure out what was actually agreed to, you know, <laughs> phone calls, double checking. Did, did Gorbachev actually, Gorbachev <laughs> accusing Baker of being a leaker at once? Like yeah. <laughs> just how tenuous the moment to moment was on a lot of these negotiations comes through so powerfully. And I think the time you two spent um, as correspondents in Moscow really gives a rich feel for the US Soviet conversations. Well, uh, that's great so to hear. Congratulations. Thank you. I think that was one of the original reasons we wanted to do the book, no question. And you could write an, a whole separate book just on this extraordinary period uh, of the end of the Cold War and, you know, seen through the lens of Baker, because uh, in many ways, you know, he he had an ability in politics and in, in his whole Washington career to focus pretty ruthlessly on what he saw as the big priority uh, and to ignore uh, even many very important subsidiary things. And uh, he and Bush came in and understood that uh, the Soviet Union was the defining challenge for them, uh, foreign policy was. And uh, they were both relentlessly focused on it, but it wasn't at all clear. Uh, you know, hindsight makes it all seem like inevitable. Uh, but in fact, uh, this is the 30th anniversary, actually just this week, of uh, German reunification. But the truth is, when they came in, uh, in January of 1989, Nobody expected uh, the wall to fall. Uh, unification seemed like a, a remote, far-off fantasy. In fact, Baker 
uh, was given a memo by the uh, top European diplomats uh, at the State Department that called it essentially a fantasy, you know, a, a good fantasy, but uh, not one that was likely to come to fruition anytime soon. Uh, when when November 9th, 1989 happened and the wall fell, it was a surprise. And yet uh, within months, uh, Baker had come up with the formulation that became the structure, the, the two plus four structure by which this agreement was negotiated. And I think going back, even though I was familiar with these events, I learned a lot, first of all, uh, that it might not have happened. Uh, and if you think about uh, the fact that only nine months later, Saddam Hussein was invading Kuwait and turning uh, you know, the US attention elsewhere, if you think about the unraveling of Gorbachev's own uh, political situation inside the Soviet Union, which was happening so rapidly, he faced the prospect of a coup, which then actually happened by hardliners. You know, so it really was this rare window. And because there was no US government plan, they had to make one on the fly. And actually, we reconstruct, you talk about these negotiations, you know, first of all, the Germans uh, were not the only obstacle here, uh, or the Soviets, but the French and the British, Margaret Thatcher, uh, was very dubious about this and not a big fan of Baker, by the way. And uh, so he also faced pressure from conservatives in the US. And when he went to get this deal, uh, hijacking the Open Skies Treaty, ironically, uh, that was being negotiated in Canada for his sort of like back corridor diplomacy, even Bush and Scowcroft back in Washington weren't really behind his plan. And, you know, there's this incredible machination. So again, I, I came away feeling once again that, you know, individuals do play a role in these big, massive uh, events. Uh, and perhaps we're seeing the inverse of that right now and some of the crises that we have in 2020. So I was the NATO desk officer in General Powell's joint staff at that time. And I think about the exquisite work that Secretary Baker did um, in putting together the coalition for the Iraq war, in getting the Soviet leadership to make the joint statement. And I remember thinking in the run up to the 2003 Iraq war, why isn't Secretary Powell traveling all over the world the way Secretary Baker did to get everybody on side? And I was struck in the book at the way you talk about um, Baker flying to Moscow so that he and Shevardnadze can make the joint statement on Iraq together. Right. At one point in the book, you, you tally how many trips, something like 258 days of the time he was Secretary of State, he was actually traveling. I think that that's a really important part of why he was so successful. What's your judgment on that? How, how much does a Secretary of State actually showing up and standing there on other people's home turf matter for their effectiveness? Well, I think it matters an awful lot. And you remember, uh, Corey, you'll remember this really well. Of course, Secretary Powell was once asked why he didn't travel more during the Bush 43 administration. And he, th and he said it's because he had to worry about what was happening back in Washington, right? He had to stay here because he was at war to some extent with Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. And he didn't necessarily have the ear of the president in, this, in the way he wanted. So he felt like if he was on the road, things could happen while he wasn't paying attention back here. So he was fighting a rear guard action. Jim Baker didn't have that problem. Jim Baker was best friends with his president. The two of them had a bond like no president or secretary of state had ever had in our history, except maybe Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, right? They were personal friends before politics. Bush was the only person Jim Baker told when his wife, his first wife was dying of cancer. They had a personal bond. So when he left the country and he was in the Middle East or in the Soviet Union or in Europe, he knew that Bush was back home and had his back and that he had Bush's back. And that there was, he always said the line he always gave us and everybody else says, there's no light between me and my president. And that worked to his benefit too, because not only did he have this, the uh, knowledge about how things were gonna work back home, and by the way, he was smart enough to make sure to bring a staff member from Dick Cheney's Pentagon on his plane with him and a staff member from Brent Scowcroft's yeah, NSC with him on the plane with him. So he had those people all tied up and he would make sure they call back to their principles. <laughs> so nobody could say later that, ba that Baker didn't have, you know, clearance to do something. But even more important, I think, was when he landed. Uh, Aaron 
friend David Miller, I think has a great image. I remember him telling us when Baker landed in the Capitol, it was like the president landed. They knew he was so close to Bush. It was He was the equivalent of, of the Bush. He could speak for the president in a way that no other Secretary of State probably in our lifetime has been able to do, except maybe Kissinger. And I think that that um, spoke to his ability and his capacity that, uh, that few of his peers had. Yeah, I, I remember at the time I was doing coalition politics in the Joint Staff and the preparations that Secretary Baker had undertaken he didn't just show up in Japan and say, we need your support uh, in 1991. He showed up and said, and if you don't feel like you can give military forces, we're going to want you to pay for the undertaking. Uh, and the United States actually turns a profit on the 91 Gulf War because Secretary Baker was so explicit about what different allies would and could contribute to the undertaking. I've never seen, I, I think that's the most extraordinary thing I've ever heard of a Secretary of State being able to pull off. <laughs> Let me ask you um, about Israel and in particular, um, the way that Secretary Baker and President Bush turned off assistance to Israel over, over expansion of um, settlements. That seemed to play into a lot of other things for Secretary Baker, in particular, some of the nastiness about what he did or didn't say about who votes for who. Tell that piece of the story, please. Well, there's, you're referring specifically to a very famous incident uh, in which he was alleged to have said, uh, fuck the Jews, uh, according to uh, uh, in inflammatory headline uh, you know, that seemed to stem from an Ed Koch column uh, and interestingly enough, it actually it was sort of a kind of a game of telephone. Uh, you know, he later acknowledged that, well, there probably was a White House meeting where I said, fuck them. Uh, but the them I meant they was APAC, uh, he says, and that they were referring to essentially the powerful sort of Israel lobbyists here in uh, Washington, as opposed to a category of people. Uh, and, you know, it, it tells you, first of all, uh, about how much the politics of Israel have changed in, in an American domestic context. Uh, it wasn't just Baker, but Bush himself. They were both extremely uh, uh, unhappy with the idea of expanding Israel settlements, uh, thought that it was an enormous obstacle uh, to a peace plan, which was something they both hoped to negotiate. Uh, and so, you know, today uh, it would be it's become almost a new catechism actually in the Republican party to be the opposite, to be more and more supportive uh, of uh, the Israeli right wing government. In fact, uh, uh, there was a young official named Benjamin Netanyahu that uh, uh, Baker had such a contentious relationship with, he actually took the incredible step of banning Netanyahu from the US State Department and declaring him wow. grata. he was not allowed. And Baker's, um, East advisors, Dennis Ross was like tearing their hair out for more than a year to try to get uh, Baker to reverse himself on this. Uh, so, you know, really a lifelong enmity with, uh, with Netanyahu, who he thought, you know, had publicly criticized him uh, and, you know, he just wasn't going to have any of it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of amazing chapter, actually. I like the way in the book you make such a point of his relish at getting people back who he felt had wronged him, like the real genuine satisfaction yes. of, of him over decades um, to be able to do that. Let me ask you to talk about Secretary Baker's role in the 2000 election. And uh, especially since both of you work on contemporary American politics as well, how do you, after telling us about Baker's role in 2000, I'd love to know your thoughts about whether the law, whether there are shadows of what happened in 2000 that we should be thinking about now as we may be entering into a contested election in 2020. Yeah, that's a great, you're exactly right about that. I mean, Florida seemed all the more relevant today uh, than even when we were writing it. I don't think we thought when we were writing that chapter that it would have such resonance today. But you're right, Jim Baker was picked by George W. Bush to manage the recount in Florida in 2000. 
And Baker was a lawyer, but it wasn't really the legal skills that he was bringing to the equation. It was the political skills he brought to the equation. And the Democrats told us when we were writing the book that once they knew Baker was appointed to be Bush's guy, they knew they had lost, that, that, that Baker would somehow figure out how to win. And in fact, they did. There's this great scene at the beginning of the recount where he sits down with Warren Christopher, who was another former Secretary of State representing Gore, but not, not a political knife fighter the way Baker is. And Christopher comes all prepared with a very serious sort of Geneva-like plan for negotiations. Well, we can, you know, wise men, we can do it this way. And Baker's now, you know, my candidate won. I'm here to preserve his victory. I'm not here to negotiate. And Christopher goes to plan B. Well, okay, if not that, then this. Because no, I'm here to, you know, I'm here not to negotiate. I'm here to preserve Governor Bush's victory. And Baker is another, one of the things that tells you about this episode is his willingness to say from the very beginning, we're going to end up in the Supreme Court which goes, was anathema to conservative orthodoxy, which says you don't go to federal courts for state disputes, right? We're federalists, we don't believe in that. Except Baker doesn't sit there and stand on ceremony or on ideology. If you're gonna to have to go to the Supreme Court to win, that's what you're gonna to have to do. And that's what they did. But the difference between then and today is, here's what I think is really interesting about this chapter. We may have Florida all over again. We may have Florida on steroids all over again, not even just in one state, but multiple states. And the difference was that Baker then, as fierce and ruthless a competitor as he was, Bush and Gore, as tough as they were, they all had basically a fundamental respect for the system. And that once they had fought it out as tough as they could through the system, and once it was over, it was over. And they all basically said, okay, now we have to come together as a nation. Gore gave a very gracious uh, concession speech at the end. Bush gave a very unifying speech. Where I'm, I'm going to present for Democrats and Republicans. And they didn't try to tear down the system. And what, what, what we're looking at right now is an incumbent president, a sitting president who is just casting doubt about the system as a whole, who's basically blowing up an election process even before it's happened, uh, regardless of the results, because uh, you know, and causing doubt, causing people to doubt the system that they have. That's a very different situation than then. So it, I agree with you that it's a very different approach, but you started that description by saying um, Baker uh, wouldn't respect the conservative principle that federal courts shouldn't judge in the state. How much culpability do you think um, James Baker and, and Republicans who, for example, would support the electoral, po uh, the position that I'm not going to negotiate anything, this is going to the Supreme Court in 2000, how much culpability do you think they bear for the way politics have changed? Because as you point out, Baker's a very He's such a pivotal figure, and it's a very different Republican Party today. How much does his do his choices as a campaign manager and as uh, the lawyer for Bush in 2000 bear on the changes that have occurred? You know, Corey, this, of course, is the question, and we wrestled with this in many ways, uh, you know, in trying to think about, uh, you know, for example, uh, Baker's wrestling with what to do about Donald Trump and this sort of hostile takeover of the party. He, he doesn't like Donald Trump. He thinks he's nuts, uh, but at the same time, couldn't re really fully renounce the party or, or, you know, even he did, he actually voted for him in 2016 uh, without endorsing him. What does that even mean, right? And so, you know, you can argue that this is a moment when that kind of pragmatism first politics uh, you know, maybe it worked brilliantly in a sort of crisis management period of uh, the late Cold War when so much was happening and the issue was not uh, fundamentally about uh, what's America's place in the world, but simply how to, you know, navigate the, the overwhelming uh, demands of day to day events or, you know, you could say that uh, in 2000, I do think that uh, you know, I know this is like a, there's almost a reflexive reaction among many people to the, you know, the subject of 2000, especially because of the current president's attacks on the system. Look, the Supreme Court owns that decision. Uh, they made their decision. Uh, it seems to me that fundamentally uh, that's uh, what they were doing. And especially because I think Baker viewed the assignment really as essentially 
being the lawyer for, uh, you know, the Republican and, and a lawyer is entitled to offer a vigorous, uh, a vigorous defense, right? So I, I think that that's how I look at that as opposed to kind of some broader statement about the political system. Now, where I think you're on much more solid ground is the question of, you know, what is the Republican Party today and how much has it been enabled uh, by people like uh, Baker who were willing to jettison uh, what seems to be core principles in the service of winning? How much is it a party whose ideology uh, has become uh, almost an ideology of power for its own sake or of winning? Uh, now, for all that, I guess I would also say that, you know, individuals in the end are accountable for their actions. And, you know, Jim Baker's 90 years old now. In his period at the Heights, uh, let's look at that record. And I think that was part of the exercise for me and Peter was to say, this is a book about a period of time that no longer exists and a Washington where the players are different and the incentives were also different. Just one short example. In 1981, Ronald Reagan had a chance to make a Supreme Court appointment. Uh, and he, Baker, urged him and was one of, you know, really the reason why he chose Sandra Day O'Connor to be the first woman ever to sit on the Supreme Court. There was enormous blowback uh, in the Reagan world and the Reagan orbit for this. The conservatives even then were wary of O'Connor, correctly as it turns out, she was the pivotal, more moderate swing vote. Uh, Baker physically blocked them from having even a meeting with President Reagan to air their grievances. Uh, so, you know, when pushed to it, that wasn't just, um, a moral pragmatism, right? You know, he had uh, a set of uh, maybe guiding stars, uh, and uh, in that sense, he was a pretty good fit, actually, with his best friend George H. W. Bush uh, in their view of things. But they were men of more personal rectitude and character uh, in ways that did translate, I believe, into their actions. So we begin to get questions rolling in. I want to encourage listeners to please, please uh, send us more. I'll be happy to be the curator of them for this conversation with Peter Baker and Susan Glasser. The first question is one that has more to do with your contemporary work than the book, which is the press has to fact check everything the president says. Is it normal that people want to check if the president actually has COVID rather than assuming he's telling the truth? <laughs> yeah, that's a Good great question. question. It really is. And I think it speaks to our times that you're right. My inbox today is filled with emails from people saying, well, do we really know that he really does? Do we think he's lying? Is he? Is there some reason why he would tell us he does when he doesn't? And boy, that's an extraordinary thing to think about, right? We're saying that the president of the United States is faking an illness in order for what to gain some advantage of some sort. I'm not entirely sure how what advantage that would be for him. But the fact that people wonder that, the fact that that line of questioning and suspicion is out there is a testament to the fact that there is such a low credibility with a president who has told at least 20,000 falsehoods, according to our friends at the Washington Post who count these things. And, you know, and, and, the, na and the nature of our times where we have, uh, we traffic in conspiracy theories that once were on the fringes, but now are part of the mainstream conversation because the president of the United States traffics in conspiracy theories. So I think it's sad, unfortunately. We do try to check everything for those who are wondering. We do do our best to fact check everything that is said to us. And uh, we don't have any reason to doubt at this point that there's a, a genuine coronavirus uh, 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 positive test. Another question from one of our listeners is, has President Trump forever changed the way the media covers DC? Or do you think he's more of an anomaly? <laughs> well, that's our breakfast conversation. Exactly. Uh, you know, I think that <laughs> oh, is actually yeah. a lot of the exercise for Peter and I over the last few years has been uh, trying to identify those areas in which Trump truly is exceptional uh, and, you know, one of a kind uh, and or doing things that are uniquely uh, uh, threatening uh, versus uh, where he is an example of a president, perhaps a particularly contentious, divisive, partisan Republican president, but where he might do you know, the same thing, uh, the ramming through the appointment of uh, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, for example, whether that happens yet or not is still not 100% clear, it seems to me. But uh, 
You know, that one, I think sure she is a, quite possibly would have been nominated by another Republican president. Whether they would choose to do so so close to an election is not clear, but look at, he has plenty of Republican partners in this exercise. Whereas obviously uh, some of the lies, disinformation, uh, uh, refusing to release your tax returns because it turns out that you only paid $750, um, you know, refusing to divest yourself of uh, financial conflicts of interest uh, or uh, do many of the things that presidents of both parties have done. Those are, you know, the things that seem very particular to Trump. As regards to the media, uh, I, I don't believe, I certainly hope that uh, no other president uh, of either party will call the media the enemies of the people, a phrase that uh, you know, was literally used by the Soviets and by Joseph Stalin to condemn millions of people to the gulag. Um, but uh, many presidents are hostile to the media, Democrats as well as Republicans. Uh, they don't uh, like to have regular uh, briefings. Uh, they chafe at freedom of information requests and the like. So um, some norms uh, may well be shattered, I would say, you know, going forward. Uh, but let's Let's see. Uh, history does tend to correct uh, for uh, excesses. Uh, at least uh, that's been our general view of American history up till now. Let's let's see if uh, that still holds. <laughs> Next question: Is it true that Amy Coney Bartlett, John Roberts, and Brent Kavanaugh worked together on the 2000 decision? Baker must have known he'd have SCOTUS in his back pocket. <laughs> uh, well, look, you know, I don't know about Amy Coney Barrett in 2000. I don't, I haven't no, heard no, that. No. He did have John Roberts, a, you know, a younger, a younger lawyer. And Ted Cruz. Uh, and Ted Cruz and John Bolton and Josh Bolton. <laughs> uh, and a lot of people who became quite uh, prominent in later years work on that uh, effort. No question. That was sort of a, you know, he, Baker put together in Florida an almost instantaneous high, t high, profile Republican law firm, the veterans of whom then went on to become bigger and better things, including Beck Kavanaugh. Um, you know, did, did Baker know he had the Supreme Court in his back pocket at that time? No. The Supreme Court wasn't quite as locked into the, to the, to the dynamic that we see today. I mean, at that point, they weren't sure about Sandra Day O'Connor or David Souter or, you know, I mean, Souter would have been on the le le left at that point, but, but Kennedy and O'Connor were kind of swing votes in the middle to some extent. They actually weren't even sure about the conservatives. They worried that some of the conservatives like Scalia mm -hmm. might laugh them out of court for the very federalism argument that they were ignoring. So they didn't really feel like they had it in their back pocket, but they felt like they had more of a chance there than the Florida Supreme Court, all of whose members had been appointed by Democratic governors and which they lost at several times. Mm -hmm. A great question, Just up. Can you compare Baker with his counterparts in the Obama and Trump administration? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I mean, look, you know, some of it uh, being Secretary of State is the person, some of it is the moment. Uh, but, you know, there's no question that he was both a, a, a more consequential and a more effective Secretary of State than uh, any Secretary of State we've seen since uh, Henry Kissinger. And I think uh, most uh, people would agree with that. Uh, you know, look, today uh, we're dealing with a situation in administration where, um, you know, quite frankly, people are uh, promoted into jobs that they never would have otherwise. Mike Pompeo, the current Secretary of State, was an obscure backbencher uh, uh, congressman who had never chaired so much as a subcommittee in his life, had very little uh, e experience uh, in this world, and uh, would be inconceivable even with any other Republican president. He never would have uh, risen to this position. And it shows his, his um, inexperience in international diplomacy. And his main uh, you know, skill set has been uh, essentially uh, the skill set of managing uh, and flattering uh, a very uh, volatile president here. You know, he's playing court politics as opposed to international politics in many ways. Uh, and, you know, even if you look at the Obama uh, administration, obviously Hillary Clinton and John Kerry were, uh, you know, much more accomplished figures uh, who had much more background. Kerry had been the longtime chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, you know, Clinton, uh, not only a, a deep study of things, but, uh, you know, actually a believer in that Baker method of, you know, extreme preparation of, you know, she was, knew her brief, shall we say, uh, in a way that sometimes other secretaries of state don't. Um, you know, Obama kept a tight leash, uh, in particular on Hillary. She was constrained. Uh, you know, Obama, in fact, undercut 
John Kerry at key moments, uh, you know, in, including perhaps the, the most embarrassing moment of their foreign policy, which was the decision to reverse course uh, on uh, Syria, uh, even after Syria had crossed what Obama himself called a red line uh, and uh, using chemical weapons on its own people. There was a decision to proceed. Kerry was actually rallying support and on phone calls all day on a famous Friday afternoon when Obama took a walk on the White House lawn and said, no way, I'm not going to do it. So, uh, you know, they face a problem with their president, I think, and also with the moment. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a sign really of uh, a different time where U.S. influence in the world also uh, just isn't what it was at this key moment when it was really sort of the Soviets and the U.S. head to head, uh, Baker and Shevardnadze. Uh, next question is, do you think the next debate should cut off microphones or fact check Trump and Biden in real time? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, a couple of things. One, I would say we're not entirely sure the debate will happen now that the president has this COVID uh, in, uh, you know, uh, infection. It's very possible that uh, that two weeks away, uh, he'll still be in some sort of an isolation. We'll see what happens. Um, if they do go forward, the idea of cutting off microphones seems like an appealing one, and maybe that's something they'll think about. But the truth is, First of all, as the president of the United States, it's really hard to cut off a president of the United States' microphone. Second of all, as Chris Wallace pointed out after the debate the other night, he says, even if you cut off his microphone, he's still going to talk and he's it's still going to be disruptive on the stage and might not necessarily solve the problem you're trying to solve. So, you know, it, I, I don't know they're going to do that. And if they did, I'm not sure it would work, but I understand the, uh, the appeal. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is, please comment on James Baker saying that because he's a Republican, he'll vote for Donald Trump, even though he's distressed by Trump's behavior. What about the calculation and rationale for Jim Baker and other traditional Republicans for remaining silent and or supporting the current president? Well, Corey, you know this, uh, this world very well yourself in the world of, you know, the endless sort of angst and, and agonies that have, you know, taken place among establishment Republicans over the last few years as they've wrestled largely unsuccessfully. Uh, Jared Kushner recently bragged in an interview with Peter that uh, they had accomplished their hostile takeover of the GOP and essentially annihilated all resistance. And as braggadocious as that was, it's, it's accurate, more or less. And I think our conversations with Jim Baker were kind of a, a window into that, right? Uh, you know, that uh, these folks not only don't like Trump, disdain his character. I mean, we've all seen those videos a million times of, you know, Lindsey Graham calling him a kook and um, uh, Ted Cruz saying he's, you know, dangerous and unfit uh, to be the president and yet look at them, you know, publicly sucking up to him constantly and being his biggest cheerleaders, no matter what norms he's blown through. Uh, you know, Baker hasn't gone to that extreme. He has not gone from anti-Trump to Trumpist. He's not a Trumpist. He, he doesn't like Donald Trump. He's made that very clear to us over a long period of time. He does think, you know, he said he thinks he's nuts. He's crazy. He's very offended by the incompetence of the White House. Uh, he is. Yeah, I imagine uh, it's a professional affront exactly. to Baker oh, to see I, I, people bad at their jobs when he took such care to be excellent at them. So much of it he sees as political malpractice. I mean, I went to see him in January of um 2017, right after Trump was inaugurated. And already, you know, there, it was crazy. Uh, and he was just the, the tone of like, you know, offensiveness, you know, in, in his, his remarks to me was so he said, you know, why does he keep talking about Mexico's gonna pay for the wall? Mexico isn't gonna pay for the wall. He shouldn't say that. They're never gonna pay for the wall. And again, so flash forward to he still, even today, um, he told us at one point, he volunteered that he was considering voting for Baker uh, and uh, sorry for Biden. And then two months later, he said, no, no, don't say that I'm a Republican. Even if my party has left me, I haven't left it. Well, he actually got coronavirus uh, this uh, summer and he's now recovered. Thank goodness, which is amazing uh, at age of 90, but he has clearly decided he really doesn't want to talk uh, and wade into the endless controversies of the Trump era more. We'll see. We're supposed to do um, some book appearances with him next week. Uh, and I imagine, given the response to the book that we've gotten so far, he will be asked uh, about this. Uh, and if he isn't, we'll ask him. <laughs> <laughs>
So the next question is a really interesting one, I think. Would Secretary Baker's personal and professional qualities be desired or effective today? How do you think he would navigate the politics of today? Yeah, it's a great question. And that's also a breakfast table conversation we've had now for four or five years. The answer to the first part of it is no. Welcome today? No, I don't think they would be. I think that the incentive structure has changed. When Baker was at his apogee, they, there was a reward system if you were bipartisan. If you sat there with a person from the other party and you, you came together to file a bill that you could call bipartisan, there was a political incentive for doing it. Today, it's a disincentive. Today, you would be accused of compromising your principles. You would be accused of selling out. You would be accused of, of being uh, you know, a rhino in the case of Republicans or Republican in name only. The idea of bipartisanship is disdained in Washington rather than uh, you know, revered. And so in that sense, Baker's skills would not be welcome today. Would he manage to somehow adapt himself to this environment? Maybe. He's a uniquely talented guy, but it wouldn't use his best skills this, this, this period because they wouldn't value them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, can you think of an example where Baker lost and then was bipartisan? Because as I was going through the book, he, he did have a genius for reaching out to uh, when he was politically active after he had defeated someone um, and finding common ground. Did he do the same thing when he was on the losing end of the debate? I think there's one example in Social Security, right? Mm -hmm. So early on in the Reagan administration, yeah. uh, Stockman, uh, David Stockman, the budget director, is allowed to make this social, actually kind of outmaneuvers Baker to make a social security uh, uh, plan that would cut basically benefits. And it's a huge disaster, blows up in their face, Democrats jump all over them and they have to retreat. And it was only after that that Baker then sat down with the Democrats to come up with a plan. So that's an instance where having lost a round where he didn't want to even play, he decided to take it off the table by creating a solution that both sides had some investment in. And that way, by the way, he inoculated his president against future attacks on Social Security. So there was a benefit in doing it on a policy level and on a political level. That's what we don't see, I think, in today's Washington so much. Today, they think a compromise means you lose an issue rather than you know, what they'd rather have in the election. That's a fabulous answer, Peter. Next question is, how did Jim Baker feel about leaving the State Department to run the White House again? Was it a step down for him? Short answer, yes. He was devastated, really. Uh, he did not want to do it. He resisted. He waited. It was passive aggressive. Uh, and when he finally was dragged into it, you know, he, he smelled the stunk of a loser. Uh, and Jim Baker <laughs> didn't want to be associated with anything losing. In fact, uh, this was something I also learned that I hadn't really fully appreciated how much he was even profoundly depressed uh, in this period. Uh, of time at uh, going back to the White House to oversee the campaign in 1992. Uh, and, you know, really uh, his own advisors were worried about him. He wasn't showing up to meetings. He wasn't leading. Uh, he didn't seem to have a plan to get them out of the uh, uh, thing, uh, to get them out of the situation where Clinton looked like he was going to be a winner. And the Bush family was really quite mad at, at Baker. This was probably the biggest test of his long, decades long friendship and relationship with George Bush and the defeat. Obviously, defeat is, is going to be hard no matter what. Uh, but in this case, Barbara Bush especially, uh, but also George W. Bush, um, I think they really held some hard feelings uh, specifically directed at Baker and a sense that he didn't have uh, George's best interests at heart. I really like the way in the book you describe this sort of minuet of Bush not wanting to have to ask Baker and Baker uh, forcing Bush to ask him because he because he actually didn't want to run the campaign. And then the fishing trip that when when Baker eventually relents, um, the gracefulness of how they knit the relationship back together on that fishing trip, I thought was really touching. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, Baker, Baker has a ranch up in Wyoming, and that's one of his favorite places on earth to be. And the two of them escaped. And you're right, it becomes the moment where he finally gives in. It's probably too late by that point. Mm -hmm. The next question is, did Jim Baker have any thoughts about traditional Republican states of Arizona um, and Texas starting to turn blue? If not, how do you think he might feel about it? 
Well, you know, we didn't talk to him about that, but remember, he's a product of the last great political realignment in American politics, uh, which was the uh, the Southern strategy, if you will, of, uh, you know, the sort of Barry Goldwater and then Richard Nixon era. Uh, he grew up a Southern Democrat, uh, uh, not a very attentive one. Barbara Bush used to joke that he, uh, you know, like preferred the opening of hunting season uh, on election day to uh, actually casting his ballot. Um, his parents, we asked him a lot about, you know, what kind of a politics did you grow up with? His main memory uh, of his very well off childhood during Depression era Houston uh, was of how much his father and his friends hated FDR uh, as, a, as sort of a class traitor. Uh, so even though they were Democrats, they were not voting Democratic at the national level even back then. Uh, but Baker identified as a Democrat. And in fact, when George Bush tried to get him into politics, uh, you know, as a Republican, uh, you know, he said, well, you know, there's two problems, uh, one of which is I'm not actually a Republican. His wife, his first wife who died, uh, Mary Stewart, was uh, was a Republican from the Midwest. And, um, you know, she was more active in politics than he was. And, you know, I think there was this broad transition uh, in Texas and across the South. And Baker, uh, you know, he's not transitioning back. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> and next question is, has there been anyone who's come close to the personal relationship between Baker and Bush? Is the Valerie Jarrett Obama relationship similar? That's a good question. Yeah, they were obviously very tight. He considered Valerie Jarrett to be like a sister, an older sister. And Valerie Jarrett had, in fact, introduced Barack and Michelle Obama to each other. So there's a, there's a real tight knit threesome in a way, a friendship there, a real family kind of relationship that's different than you see in a lot of White Houses. Of course, Valerie Jarrett wasn't Secretary of State, uh, but you, you could think of some other White Houses with those kind of relationships. Obviously, Jack and Bobby Kennedy uh, were very tight. Uh, there are probably some you know, other examples of Republicans who are really tight, but I don't think between a president and a Secretary of State, I think those that relationship is unique. Mm -hmm. And uh, but President Bush also had a famously close relationship with National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft. Mm -hmm. You talk in the book about some of the frictions between Scowcroft and Baker. Talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, it's really interesting. He was very careful, actually, with Scowcroft, because I think he did understand how close Scowcroft had become to the president. And in some ways, people hold uh, Scowcroft's NSC and the model of this national security team of Baker, Dick Cheney at the Pentagon and Scowcroft at the NSC as sort of a model for how to get along uh, with a national security team, unlike the very fractious George W. Bush uh, uh, feuding, uh, you know, Colin Powell and then Condi Rice at State versus uh, Rumsfeld uh, at the Pentagon. You know, that was vicious. Um, so it wasn't like that, but there were natural frictions. And I think it spoke to the fact that Bra Baker really had become a Washington principal in his own right. You know, the other people were talking about like Valerie Jarrett or, you know, Mac McClarty was Bill Clinton's childhood friend and, and first chief of staff. The truth is they had derivative power uh, and they were in the model that's more familiar to Washington of the kind of trusted friend slash confidant. Whereas Baker, because of his great success in this series of powerful jobs, had become a principal in his own right. You know, And I think that graded on Bush. In fact, he used to joke when they would have arguments. First, in the Reagan era, he would say, well, if you're so smart, you know, how come you're not vice president? Later, he upgraded that and said, well, if you're so smart, how come you're not president? Uh, and that was when Baker knew to back off, actually, in their argument. So, you know, I think it spoke to the, the enormous power and respect he had acquired in his own right, really. <laughs> so we have time for one last audience question, and it is, will the Democrats ever forgive Mitch McConnell, and should they? Are we seeing permanent damage to the Senate in real time? Well, I think what we've seen, unfortunately, is a lot of, you know, one-upsmanship every time the Senate uh, changes party control. And each party can point to the other side and say, well, you know what they did, you know what they did back then, and that justifies what we're doing now, right? Oh, well, the Democrats were blocking Bush, uh, you know, so that's not really fair. Well, the, you know, Republicans changed these rules, the Democrats changed these rules. We can walk through them, I know them all. You know, the point of the matter is nobody is stopping and nobody is saying, hey, we need to stop escalating because we're, we're challenging that we're, we're throwing away norms, not only that have governed for many, many decades and, and generations, but have actually been useful to us, right? Each side will pay the price 
of having thrown away, you know, something in order to get their advantage in a short term way, because each side, of course, at some point or another will be in the minority. So if you throw away the filibuster, guess what? You're going to worry at some point when you would have liked to have had the minor- uh, filibuster. If you, if you, you know, uh, if you decide you're going to uh, jam through a nomination uh, right before an election, guess what the other side is going to do to you? I mean, that the logic of what Mitch McConnell is doing right now with the court is interesting. What he's not saying is it's because it's close to the election. What he's saying is because we have the control of the Senate and the White House, and therefore we can have a nominee when we want and not have a nominee. Well, by that logic, there wouldn't be a Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court. There wouldn't be an Antonin Scalia or a William Rehnquist because those were uh, appointed by a Republican president with a Democratic Senate. The, 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 you're now basically saying we only got to uh, have Supreme Court justice if we have both in the same control of the same party. That's dangerous for both sides. Mm-hmm. So let me take the privilege of asking a closing question, and it's a softball right over the middle of the plate to you two. What was the favorite thing? um, One of the things that makes the book so extraordinary is the access you had to Secretary Baker's papers. What was the most interesting thing you found in them? Mm. Mm. (laughs) Well, you know, I will say for my part, uh, well, there there are two things uh, here. One, files and files of uh, these notes from his father uh, that, you know, were this incredible portrait of like, you know, kind of like life in, you know, upper middle class Houston in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, his dad, Baker's already a grown man. He's, he's married. He's got kids. Uh, he's a lawyer uh, at a respected law firm. But his father is writing him checks for like $25 for the housekeeper, uh, for his Brooks Brothers suit, for his wife's birthday present. Uh, you know, the controlling, even stultifying nature uh, of his childhood. That that just came out to me in a way that it, it, no interview could have given. And then, you know, the other really amazing thing uh, I think was uh, a good tip off uh, from the archivist. They always know what's, you know, what's the good stuff uh, in there. Uh, actually were the notes from Baker's own memoir that he wrote uh, and the back and forth with his staff and with the ghostwriter uh, over what he was going to take out of the book and the ferocious fights that they had over this. It, watching essentially in real time, the master of cultivating his own image, cultivating his own image and trying to sort of politically sanitize uh, his memoirs. I mean, that, that was just incredible uh, to, to be able to see that uh, was really remarkable. Our special thanks to Peter Baker and Susan Glasser, co-authors of the book, The Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III, for joining us today. Copies of The Man Who Ran Washington are available everywhere books are sold, so please make sure you buy one. It's an outstanding book. We'd also like to thank our audience for watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Corey Shockey. Thank you, my friends. And please, everyone, stay safe. Thank you, Corey. Corey. How wonderful. What a treat to be with you today. Thank you. And thanks to the Commonwealth Club.